afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Neil Kenny Geyer, and uh, I have the distinct pleasure and privilege of moderating this amazing, amazing panel here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to remind us what we're going to focus on in case, you know, you, 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 as we all get on airplanes, you know how they say, just in case you got on the wrong flight. So just in case you thought you were going to another gathering. This is the one that is really going to look at the role private investment can play in, first of all, doing no harm in fragile contexts, but more importantly, in advancing peace. And it grows out of a World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council with the very uplifting title called uh, Fragility, Conflict, and Violence. Um, but the report of that title, um, the report of that group, Agenda Council, focused on the role that private investment can play in really stabilizing and accelerating peace in very fragile contexts. Um, we've got, as you can tell, an absolutely amazing panel here, um, starting first and foremost, and I think we're all completely honored and delighted to welcome uh, President Santos of Colombia. Um, as we know, uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and was just awarded by Klaus Schwab, the, the Forum's Global Statesman uh, Award. And we, don't, we won't do this for any of us else, but I want you to just stop with me in a second. And, and we were talking earlier, and I was saying, you know, we look at the state of the world today and rising fragility. And, you know, peace in Colombia will always be so important for the Colombians but it has a special place in the world today. So I wish, join me in just welcoming President Santos. Um, then I'm gonna move around and, and to my left is Rania Almashat, who is the senior advisor to the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. Um, she also served for a decade as the Deputy Governor of Egypt's Central Bank. So, Rania, welcome. Um, and then immediately to um, her left is Sipo Milipitiana, who is the chairman of Anglo Gold Ashanti and a leading philanthropist and activist for political reform in his native South Africa. Um, and then over, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Philippe Loero, uh, who is the uh, CEO of the International Finance Corporation, um, the IFC. Uh, and then immediately next to uh, Philippe is uh, Peter Brabeck. He told me not to pronounce his last name, so otherwise, <laughs> as, as, uh, but uh, Peter is the chairman of Nestle, you know, a long and distinguished global business leader. And also for, for any of you who are interested, the, the chairman of Formula One Racing. Um, um, so, um, uh, that, I, so we do have an incredible, incredible panel. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to start off with President Santos. Um, and and first of all, if the, I know everyone here who particularly didn't have a chance to hear you speak earlier, uh, would love any quick update um, on the peace agreement. And what I was struck by, you you talked about how. Um, you know, conflict and war had been such a break on Colombia and on the economy. And then if you could comment on how maybe private investment can be an accelerator for peace. Well, absolutely. First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me in this uh, panel. Um, for the countries that consider private investment as uh, partners in growth, like we do in Colombia, and if it happens that we are coming out of a conflict, private investment is absolutely indis indispensable. Uh, it, it is needed uh, because um, the opportunities that open up uh, in terms of growth, in terms of investing uh, in the areas where the state was not present, in terms of uh, taking the infrastructure where it's needed, um, the state by itself is very difficult to be able to, to do that, especially do it quickly. So uh, uh, this partnership with private investment becomes uh, a key tool to be able to 
give quick results. Um, and uh, in the experience that we have, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the development of the rural areas that have been affected by the conflict, um, the peasants need to get together with large investors. They, they don't have the capacity uh, by themselves right. of bringing technology uh, or getting uh, uh, new markets, getting to the markets. So private inv investors go there and f fill this vacuum. And then there's a win-win situation in every, in every respect. Um, to my right, well, uh, there's a company that has been present in Colombia in very difficult areas, Nestle, I have been there, and uh, we know that uh, Nestle and many other companies are seeing a tremendous opportunity. Right. And as from the government point of view, this is ideal because they bring what is needed, they partner up with the, the government, and the the country, the process uh, is the one that is going to be benefited. We we think that uh, peace will add to our growth. There are different studies and different uh, models uh, the economists use, but there will be between 1% and 2% more growth because what can be developed uh, is huge. And it's I sometimes compare it to the, the Wild West in the United States in the 19th century. Uh, there's half of the country which is very fertile, very pretty, completely untouched. And uh, we can develop that, of course, in a sustainable way, sustainable way but uh, the potential there to, for Colombia, for example, to become a, a source of food in a world that is starting to look, where is the food going to come from? Uh, you, you, you had the Chinese president yesterday. I've been talking to him many times. Uh, they're worried, how are we going to feed our people in 30 or 40 years. Where is the food going to come from? Colombia is one of the seven, eight countries that the World Food Organization has uh, has uh, uh, mentioned as a country with tremendous potential to increase the production of food. But there you need private investment. The government by itself cannot do it. Right. Thank you. If I may, if I may follow up, um, and y you know, I think we all know, particularly those of us um, who work in South America and Latin America, um, Colombia is a real leader in realizing impact investment for social progress. Um, and since we are at the World Economic Forum, and this is in many ways the conceptual home of multi-stakeholder partnerships. And I'd like to ask you, Mr. President, how you and your government are fostering multi-stakeholder partnerships today to support and accelerate the peace process. Well, there are many projects that we are, uh, we are uh, putting in place that are already in place, and especially the ones that we're planning to put in place in the future because of the opportunity that we have now. Um, and there are projects that uh, are geared towards the most vulnerable part of society. Uh, the poverty in Colombia and is in many of the countries of the world where there's poverty, uh, like the one we have in Colombia, is concentrated in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you f focus the most vulnerable parts of, of, uh, of the society, then your dividends will be much higher. We established in Colombia a, a different way of measuring poverty. Uh, this is a, 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 a system that was developed by uh, Amirta Sen, the yes. former yeah. Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, he's a professor. He was my professor at Harvard and at, at the LSE. But he developed a, a organization called the, the or a foundation in, in Oxford University okay. for human development. And it's called a multidimensional uh, approach to poverty. And it's not the monetary measurement of how much you earn. It's the basic necessities. How are they being fulfilled? And we started using this indicator six years ago 
and it has been extremely successful. Uh, modesty apart, Colombia is a country that has lowered poverty more than any other country in Latin America, 12 and a half percent in five years. Uh, and uh, because we're using that type of approach to, to instead of trying to increase, which we have also uh, the level of income, is to supply the basic necessities of families. Simple things right. that have a much higher return in terms of the social dividend of that investment. Um, that's one other question that I'm going to move out around. Um, it, it's been my experience that Colombia spawns uh, an unbelievable number of young social entrepreneurs. Uh, you, you know, maybe more than anywhere else in Latin America today. When we, you know, we think of young social entrepreneurs, you often think about Kenya and the Horn of Africa, right? And and what what they have done. Um, uh, and I know they are building social enterprises that are helping to solve many of the issues there. What role do they pet play in the peace process? Well, um, a very important role because it's th these type of entrepreneurs that uh, have a social mind um, become a, a, an important factor of uniting communities right. that have been divided. Um, we've been we made a tremendous effort also to to in, in a parallel form to to modernize the country in terms of access to technology. <laughs> And uh, we have managed in the last five years to connect every single municipality huh. with fiber optic and broadband. Um, and uh, with these social entrepreneurs uh, in the very remote, most remote areas, you're starting to find some incredible uh, experiences and, and examples of, of, yeah. of uh, peasants in their very remote area using technology improve the, the livelihood of the community. Right. And it's a, like a snowball effect. This is, this is something which has been extremely important. Yeah, I, you, you know, I would just I remind all of us here, you, you, you know, um, Colombia has spawned all these social entrepreneurs in times of conflict. We, we can only imagine what's gonna happen now in times of peace. Uh, it's gonna be fantastic. Um, Rania, if I could turn to you, um, you so so much of your career, you've had a focus on stabilizing and growing emerging markets. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to ask in general, based on your own experience, what role do you see the private sector, private investment playing in helping to promote peace? And number two, especially given your own background with the central bank, um, what role can the central bank uh, play in public policy in general in reducing risk of private investment or even more incentivizing private investment? Uh, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, something which is uh, very important to keep in our back, uh, in the back of our mind is that fragility is not only about violence and conflict. Hmm. Fragility uh, has different sources. It could be ineffective uh, economic institutions, mismanagement of economic policy, which leads to poverty and inequality. So fragility is not only about um, a, a conflict, which could be resolved through peaceful uh, mechanisms or unpeaceful mechanisms, but it is the role of public policy, actually, to try at the very onset to, through um, uh, what I would call building uh, very clear institutional policy frameworks to avoid uh, states going into fragility. Right. And this is extremely crucial if we want to incentivize the private sector. And why is that? The private sector, and we have um, both the IFC and, and, and international companies here, uh, is looking for states that have transparent, uh, accountable, uh, and uh, well-communicated policies. Because uh, that by itself reduces the risk of coming into a country. And that incentivizes the private sector to come in. So uh, when we say uh, a, a policy framework, what is very important is to have very clear objectives and the state able to translate how it's going to use specific instruments to meet these objectives. There's a tendency uh, when a problem comes up that the, you know, the public policy sometimes uh, resorts to very short-sighted procedures 
to solve a short-term problem. But these procedures in themselves actually exacerbate uh, uh, what mm. might be the sources of fragility. So what I, I would say is that uh, policymakers have to be very mindful uh, when it comes to uh, communicating transparent policy frameworks. And I put frameworks here over and over and, uh, because sometimes uh, it is overlooked. And as we are uh, here in Davos thinking about uh, the new narrative, um, there is a social contract, a new social contract, which has to be, I think, on the minds of everyone. Uh, and that includes uh, all stakeholders being part of uh, mm -hmm. contributing to that framework. If I may follow up, you, you know, you served a very critical time in Egypt, in the Central Bank. It was during the Arab Spring and afterward. Now, how did you think about then using bank policies to create a more positive environment, you know, create jobs for young people to think about a more peaceful future? Um, I think uh, the first thing that was on our mind uh, as a central bank in these very turbulent uh, uh, periods, because it was, I mean, it started in 2000, and, you know, it's the, the anniversary, the sixth anniversary of uh, the revolution is on the 25th of January, so um, uh, it's a week away. Uh, I think the, the key element uh, was to uh, repeat the message that the central bank is independent and that we do not have a political stance. We are an institution uh, that tailors to macroeconomic stability. We did not want the public to lose confidence in the banking sector, uh, and thankfully we avoided any banking run. Of course, we had uh, uh, issues related to um, you know, typical drawdown in reserves, capital outflows, uh, but overall there was a, a very important effort from our side uh, to step away from politics, and that was giving us very uh, much confidence uh, with the public as well as with international community, uh, whether it's IFIs uh, or the private sector that mm -hmm. was in the country and decided not to leave. Oh, great, thank you. Sipo, mm -hmm. if um, Anglo Gold Ashante, you know, you've got a long history of working in really fragile places, sure. places that have struggled with good governance, um, often, often with conflict, um, <coughs> and yet you've succeeded very well. Um, what's been your secret? How do you think about the principle of doing no harm there? And then I'm going to follow up after that. Well, thank you very much. But I can't resist the temptation of uh, the, um, congratulating President Santos. Last year, he received us very well in his country. Uh, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who published a book, No, no Peace Without right. Forgiveness, uh, autographed a copy which I was very pleased to share with him. And now he has joined the community of peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Well, let me say this, that uh, we come from a perspective that says um, doing no harm is a minimalist approach. In fact, our, one of our core values as an organization is that we must leave communities where we invest better off than, then, than where they were when we started off. That begins to set a, a journey which says, when you get in an environment, you need to understand the developmental challenges of that environment um, and, and understand how you can partner with the uh, various parties there. Unfortunately, as gold mining business, uh, the good Lord has not located um, uh, these assets in uh, exotic places like Davos. Um, <laughs> you find them in all kinds of uh, places which may be uh, difficult, may have difficult challenges. So we tend to follow good geology rather than good geography. Um, and in that context, therefore, we, we have to do that. Uh, and we take a comprehensive approach, um, which, which looks at um, uh, uh, enabling and introducing our standards. Okay. As a company that operates in the developed world, uh, like the United States and, 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 and Australia, and in underdeveloped right. communities, there is a huge variation. Um, the regulatory framework in the developed world is, is very clear, it's well articulated. Uh, in others, mm -hmm. it's not. We operate on the basis that the standard that we apply in Australia is a standard that must prevail in the DRC, is a standard that must mm -hmm. prevail in Guinea. So we, we tend to use that as a, as a base, and our operators work within that framework. 
So that's, that's, that's what we do. And we've, we've um, uh, worked hand in hand with governments in different places. I could give a, a, an, an example. Um, we have a joint venture in, in the DRC, which is one of those post-conflict environments, which includes another major mining company. Uh, it also includes government. Right. But importantly, it includes civil society in its very established, quite vocal uh, uh, forms, international civil society, which works with locals. And also, it, in, it involves locals, so that we hear directly what the locals' expectations are. And that has seen us um, do some interesting things. For instance, in the DRC, that's uh, an approximately $2 billion investment. We have um, um, uh, uh, looked at issues around skills development. Right. Uh, in, most, in most jurisdictions, people go in and have um, uh, experts run operations ad infinitum. There we've had a very clearly articulated strategy of ensuring that we generate the best engineers in a country where education is not very high, mm. and we have uh, high levels of skills development. And secondly, we have procurement uh, processes that ensure that the de development of local entrepreneurs as a result. Our hydropower uh, investment for the mine provides 90% of energy for, for the region, and that has enabled the emergence of other entrepreneurs like banks and telecommunications. Mm. So the socioeconomic infrastructure that arises as a result of that intervention there has been uh, phenomenal, and this is what we do in other jurisdictions as well. Can I, can I just Please. mention that something which I think is extremely important to see if we can find a way to work together with more uh, efficacy, to, more, to get more results. Uh, usually, conf uh, countries with conflicts <coughs> have illegal sources of money, right? uh, drug, drugs or illegal mining. Yeah. Uh, how mm -hmm. can we work together with the legal uh, companies to fight the illegal uh, market of, for example, gold. Yes, yes. In, the case, in the case of the whole of, of South America today, are having an increasing problem with illegal mining. Yeah. Not only gold, mm -hmm. other, right. other. Uh, uh, I think it's it's like drug, like the drug uh, uh, traffic. It's it's a, it's global. Problem that has to be approached also globally, Absolutely. because that gold or cotton or whatever is it's sold here in Switzerland or Paris or whatever, and I think there's a, uh, a, a need for much better collaboration between private companies with the governments yes. to fight that <coughs> source of illegal funds that feed the conflicts. Right. That's. And that's the point, isn't it? You often find those overlapping and reinforcing one another, the illicit flows, the illegal trade, um, and the support for conflict. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a very important question. In fact, uh, the International Council for Mines and Metals uh, is seized with this matter, and we've had uh, extensive conversations. Uh, President Santos would know, as we briefed him last year, we've, we have a pilot project uh, in, in Colombia where we're looking at separating illegal miners and small-scale artisanal miners. And here's an issue. In most jurisdictions, you'd find that you actually have small-scale artisanal miners who get criminalized when we come in because uh, countries tend to be attracted by the fact that you're a big player, you're going to have a big impact on the economy and all of that, and sideline um, uh, small-scale artisanal miners. And our approach is that there is room to create a legal framework for these small-scale artisanal miners to get the benefit of uh, a partnership right. with an established miner so that they can mine safely uh, and they can take care of the environment and they can uh, ensure that they comply right. with uh, good labor practices of uh, decent work, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. And in that way, that enables us to isolate the illegals. And the language that prevailed in the mining industry for a long time was to lump these small-scale artisanal miners, people who were acting for a living, with um, illegals. And you would find, in fact, that illegal miners 
uh, syndicated international criminals who are quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And to deal with them, you need collaboration with government. And the first okay. step there is to ensure that governments uh, uh, recognize that you can treat the locals who are true entrepreneurs decently and create partnership and an empowering relationships with established mining players. And that's what we do. We've tried this in, uh, we're trying this in Colombia, in, in Ghana, in Tanzania. Of course, it's a, it's a pilot project. Right. We hope that it will work. To a great extent, it depends on <coughs> government being prepared to come to the party with the regulatory framework. Right. Uh, and enabling us to work together on this. I illegal mining is a problem for, for established mining industry, right. as it is a problem for governments right. and right. communities. I will tell you something that, uh, uh, an interesting example is that in Ghana, uh, we had uh, our mine run over by illegal miners, uh, in our view, a situation that was permitted by the previous government in Ghana. Because of the nature of the partnership that we had with the local communities, right they were so incensed by, uh, by all of this, and they were on the, our they side. They came to your defense. They came to yes. our defense. So it is possible as a result right. of working well with, with the right. communities and showing the benefits, right. because they knew that the water that they have, the energy supplied in the community, and the, the schooling for, uh, uh, for the communities around there, in part, was as a result of our operations being right. there. Right. So they felt that illegal miners constituted a serious threat to Great. their benefits from that operation. Great. Thank you, Sipo. Thank you. Philippe, I know the IFC is entering this space. In some ways, has you know, been encroaching in it for quite a while. And you're, you're a leader in moving the institution there. So tell us how the IFC thinks about its own role here. Um, and also, take us down to a more practical level of how we can get it done. What does it take? Well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, it's true that we are a new strategy in IFC where we, we decided to try to lean forward on the fragile states, fragile and conflict-affected uh, states, which is not easy on private sector. I remind you that uh, IFC finance without government guarantee, right. so we take uh, the sovereign risk plus commercial risk, or all the risks, uh, and it's quite risky. So attracting investors to Iraq or Afghanistan is not that easy, but it's feasible. In fact, in Iran, we just did on a purely uh, privately financed uh, basis uh, a new power plant in Kurdistan region of uh, Iraq. We, uh, in Afghanistan, we set up a private uh, telecom company that prospered extremely quickly, by the way. So there are a lot of opportunities. The problem is if we want to scale up, we need to rethink the way we approach the, the, the work we do. And I call that going from going with the market to creating markets. And financing projects to creating projects. We need to step up that. So creating markets, what Rania talked, is very important. This is the environment. So we have to work with the government. We want in, uh, in IFC now to leverage our colleagues from the World Bank across the street and the IMF across the street to create this condition at the regulatory framework, the macro level, because otherwise it's not going to happen. So that's one thing. But that's not enough. We need to also create the project and work with the entrepreneur locally, because there's a lot of entrepreneurial talent. In fact, I was in Burma, I signed the deal. But before signing the deal, we had to do two years of technical assistance, accounting, governance, environment, and social uh, standards. So two years before we're at the level, we're comfortable to uh, invest because we have our own uh, standards. Okay. So it means cr shifting from waiting for the project to come to you to be a little bit more proactive. But that means a lot more boots on the ground, being close to the client, putting more in advisory services. So that's the few things. The other thing that is needed is de-risking. Instruments. Yes. We have to be more innovative with our right. instrument, and in my way, in my view, we should reopen the use of um, <coughs> official development aid or DA. <coughs> because if you give a grant for one dollar, one dollar, you have one dollar of projects. If you de-risk with one dollar and you put it as a ten percent of first loss guarantee, you can multiply, and that's the billions to trillions. That's right. the only way. So we need to be much to rethink 
the use of ODA and what we call blended finance. Right. So right. that on the financial side, you can start the risking and then the risk appetite, you'll see much more uh, uh, entrepreneur that would be willing to put their money uh, at risk because at the end of the day, it's all about risk return. And the last point is, we are talking about jobs. You want to do, to, I wish you beyond no harm, do good. Right. Create jobs. Do more good. If you yes, want basic, peace right. to last, you need the jobs. I know it's, it's not very sexy to say that, but it's fundamental. Need jobs is SME, small scale enterprises. 90% of the jobs are created by SMEs. I know, again, this number is very well known, but it's good to repeat it. Now, how do you develop an SME uh, network in a post-conflict situation? Again, you have to work with the local banking uh, system, and, you can, and there are ways to assess the risk, which is very different from uh, <coughs> uh, working in uh, uh, developed countries. We have the tools. But we have to develop that. But that goes also with a lot of technical assistance. Technical assistance also to the SME themselves. Right. As I said, this Burma example, that's an SME. A lot of technical assistance, advisory, I don't like technical assistance, but advisory services, right. holding hand. And for that, you have to be present. So you have to be present physically. Sometimes you push and it doesn't work. In South Sudan, we had a big conference, we had high hopes. We had a huge conference on uh, investment climate, and uh, we had proposal on concrete uh, reforms, etc. And then there was a relapse. But you have to start again. The, the first, uh, first time you have another opportunity, I'm looking at the president. Yes. Never stop, push, continue. Another opportunity, go for it. So I mean, I, I know it sounds a bit uh, commonsensical, but to do it on the, on the ground is important. And things are quite surprising. I mentioned Iraq, I mentioned Afghanistan. We did a project to link, and on top of that is a sustainable energy. You know, you have excess uh, hydropower right, right. in uh, Kyrgyzstan, in the Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. They have a huge deficit in Pakistan. So the idea, and very expensive, the idea is how to bring a two cents kilowatt hydropower from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to the north of Pakistan, where the cost was 20 cents a kilowatt hour and blackouts. So we did the line, a transmission line, but you have to go through the most conflict affected part of Afghanistan to do that. And that I would join what you said, which is how- Community. Right? Exactly, because everybody told me it's very simple. You put the lines, that's, right. a, that's a transmission, it's very simple, it's a line right. on the pole. Right. It's very easy to cut. Right. So, you know, you have- a, terrorist group, you cut it, it's very, very, very simple, it goes very quickly. The only way to protect it, and it works, is to have along the line development program right. for the local community, where in fact it becomes their interest to defend that asset. Right. And it does work, so it's the same, uh, same experience. So all this has to come together, and right. every conflict, every country is different, so you have to adjust, and we just created a tool uh, called the Conflict Analysis Tool, because we need to bring <coughs> political analysis, as well as the private sector right. perspective, right. The, 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 the regulatory, macro. So we're trying to devise this tool, I think we'll be ready in a few months, to do it more systematically and apply it to the local right. conditions. Great, thank you. Um, Peter is gonna comment right now on how Nestle thinks about this. And also, Peter, love to get your comments. You've, you've seen a lot. You've seen where business can really make a difference in terms of supporting a peace process. And you've probably also seen a few places where it doesn't work. And so we'd love to draw on your experience. But also, I, then we're going to turn to this great audience here. So I want you to get your energy up, your good questions, and uh, let's get a good conversation going. So I'm going to open it up as, as, as soon as Peter has a chance to comment. Peter, please. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and congratulations, frankly, to the award. It was very emotional. Uh, I think we were talking about fragile states. I think uh, Colombia is a very good example that that's not necessarily the only place where we have such a situation because right. I wouldn't have called uh, Colombia a fragile state for the last 50 years. I think it was a very well-established state, as a matter of fact, with a very well-developed economy, education system, and right. that. But within, you had a fragile area. 
And the thing which is common to all of it is, of course, the moment you say fragile for whatever reason fragile it is, you have poverty. This is, this is the one common denominator for everything which is fragile yeah. around. Okay? And the second thing which is very important is that unfortunately, this poverty is expressed in these fragile areas mainly on the level of the youth. And this is one of the reasons why you have in these areas, as the youth has no, has no employment, is extremely poverty. They are extremely vulnerable to become part of whether the guerrilla or whether it is the narco-traffico or whatever it is. It is because they are the most affected part of it. Okay? So I think this is extremely important to understand that when we are talking about fragile, it is always the same uh, identification that we have. And it is clear uh, that from, a, from, a, from a, a business perspective, if I'm talking in general terms, first of all, we have today about 1.2 billion of people living in fragile situation. Yep. Okay? Out of that, 600 million and more are young, it's a young generation. Now think about it. 600 million of young people who are lost for the society in the future just because they're living in this situation. So this is the reason why, frankly speaking, even for a private company, uh, we are not doing uh, any, any, any social things. We, we are just looking also from a business perspective. 1.2 billion of people, 600 million of young people generation, this is a very important market. And therefore we have an interest. We have a business interest in order to help that business and, and value can be created again in this, in this fragile area. It was interesting to listen to President Santos when he said, the peace agreement, if it can be carried out like he has it in his mind, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't carry it out, mm -hmm. might have an impact of 1%, 2% of GDP growth. Well, for any company, that's quite interesting, I must say. It's an interesting part. So I, I think we have an interest as a private company to help to overcome this fragile situation. There's no doubt about it. So it's not only philanthropic. Right. It's not. I, I always have right. tried to say, you know, uh, we are doing this in order to create value, both for our shareholders, but also for the society we are living in. There's a because business it's case. Good, a, yeah. It's a good business right. case, okay? Then you are willing to invest. Now, the second thing is which comes up, and I think that was uh, mentioned here by Philippe. In most of those cases, it is very difficult for the private sector to invest and to create tourism because of the, the risk is one thing. Risk can be managed by the uncertainty of the situation. And therefore, whatever, whatever uh, the multilateral uh, uh, institutions can do in order to create a better right. governance around it is extremely welcome. Which also means that if we want to be, as a private sector, effective in these fragile areas, I think we cannot do it alone. Let's, let's, let's be quite clear. It can always be in partnership with. So, Partnership with IFC, but also in partnership with the local. If we are, and I'll mention a little bit what we are going to do and what we are doing just in Colombia now, well, we do it together with the Federación Nacional de Cafeteros, which is the one who is the community in the things, and community has been mentioned before. Extremely important that you are part of the community. Right. If you're not part of the community, I think you, you, you will not be able to do something. Then. So in the case, and uh, I know I want to be short, but if I take now following the peace agreement uh, that uh, President Santos has been mm -hmm. able to achieve, uh, we, have, we are working now uh, to work in the area that uh, was the domain of, of the FARC uh, with a new coffee project in order to bring forward uh, and help the farmers to be able to hopefully change from perhaps truck or coca production over to coffee production mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. where Colombia is, has, an, has an, a relative advantage, the best to none in the world, frankly speaking. And we, have, we are launching now, uh, in February already, just immediately reacting to this peace agreement, we are launching a new coffee, uh, which we are exporting from Caqueta, exactly from the reason, which is called Aurora de la Paz, that will be the name of the product, 
and we will sell it worldwide uh, and helping therefore uh, 35,000 farmers, small, wow. small scale farmers down there, with whom we have been working over the last couple of months, and the product is ready, and we're going to launch it. And I hope that this is one sign again. It's good for my business, I say it straight away, but I hope it's also very good for the beast process, for the people, for the farmers who find a new way in order to create value and also create jobs for the, for the uh, young population. Great, that's fantastic, thank you. Let's open it up, and all I would ask is that you identify yourself and that you ask a question. Please. Hi, my name is Daniel Buritica. I'm a global shipper from Colombia. I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, I'm here at Davos because I create a, a camp of reconciliation camp. I bring together former guerrilla soldiers from FARC and victims. And they are able, after a week, to work, work together to create a camp for low-income kids. And uh, talking with them, uh, my feeling is that they are scared. They are scared because they have a fear to be rejected by society. Uh, so my question is, how do you think that private investment can help us Colombians to build a new social contract where all Colombians are included? Let me turn first to President Santos. Thank you, and, and this this example of the young uh, it's, social it's a very good, a very good example. Uh, and what what he mentioned is a key word: scared. How to build trust? Uh, trust in your own future. Trust in the future of your community. Um, and uh, I was speaking before we started uh, with uh, the chairman of Nestlé about people. People still are uh, scared that uh, the peace process won't work, mm -hmm. or they don't even believe in the peace process. They say, no, no, these people, at the end, they, they will go back to what they were doing. Uh, 52 years of war changes a lot of minds, and uh, to change that, wow. it's, it's a very, very uh, difficult effort, but um, I'm sure that when you start uh, delivering the goods and people see it. Well, I tell a lot of people in Colombia, uh, you still don't believe that the FARC are going to lay down their arms because they, they still have the arms. But we are, this last weekend, we were <laughs> seen on television the FARC coming out of the jungles, coming down from the mountains with their, with their rifles, with their armament, and going to these zones where they're going to give the arms to the United Nations. Still, people don't believe. People, oh, they're coming to, they're coming to my region and they get scared. Uh, they need uh, to see tangible results. That's where the, I think the <coughs> private sector, uh, if Nestlé goes and tells these people, listen, I'm going to buy your, your milk or your coffee or your cocoa or I'm going to finance uh, this new land and come here and work then they'll say, oh my God, this is true. But it, it, it's, you need to change a bit the, the mentality and, the, and, and build trust in, in, in the process. And when, once you build trust uh, and confidence, then things start to work. Unfortunately, lack of trust uh, is uh, one of the problems that uh, uh, what has happened worldwide. You know? The last of the... the Lack of trust in the institutions, lack of trust in the leaders, what you're seeing all around the world. Right. There's a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a salesman for a, a very good book of the, he, I think he's here in Davos because we were going to, we were going to meet. Uh, I called him, I had ne I've never, I never met him, but I, I, I read a book called Enough Said by the CEO of the New York Times. He was a former BBC. Yes. General Director Mark Thompson, talking about this issue about how trust has been disappearing, uh, and uh, this is this is something which is key for the communities to build and to and to uh, work together, and the private sector if it helps to build this trust by providing tangible results, then I think this is a great, great. contribution. Right. 
Great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, please. May I say one thing? I mean, Peter. Uh, in a similar situation, well, still not similar situation, in a, in, a, in a fragile situation, South Sudan, Philip was mentioning before, we are working, we have been working in South Sudan, also on the coffee side, in order to help in this very difficult area. Together with you, you have helped us with the 3.5 million uh, uh, loan, which we exactly what we dis discussed before, and we have been developing the coffee sector because, I mean, uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia is where the right. coffee was really, right. I mean, that's where it came from. Now, and as you were mentioning, in the middle of the effort that we have done, and we have launched a new product also in, 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 and brought it, brought it to the world, war comes back. Right. And the question that, that you were raising, uh, we, we have been trying now, we cannot physically go into this region just now. So we have started with the farmers. You can imagine they started to see, and suddenly everything falls back. Right. The only thing what we have been doing, and that might be uh, at least, we have used social media now in order to keep contact with the farmers. And what we did physically before, by having agronomists visiting them, we are trying to do it now via the, via the, social, uh, via the social media to continue to help them in order to improve their yield and the things like this. So that is... Uh, it, it, it gives them at least uh, a feeling that they have not been abandoned from one day to the other again. Because that's exactly what they are, what, what they are really worrying about. I mean, I remember when we started, even in Colombia, when we started this milk instead of cocoa, the problem was they, they didn't believe us very much. Because uh, normally, uh, two months later, the FARC were there again and, 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 and destroyed what was left, blew up our factories, and, and, and then, then they had to go back. So that this insecurity. So now we are trying with social media to give them the feeling they're not alone, okay? And telling them, the moment we can physically, we will come back. We will continue to work with them. You're not alone. I think that's at least it's a help. It's right. not a solution, but no. at least That's help. great. Thank Sorry, you. Then, for what it's worth, I just want to say this, that... Uh, uh, the book by Archbishop Tutu yes. is titled No Peace Without Forgiveness. The signing of this peace deal is the start of a journey. Where that journey is going to end up is going to depend on how much premium Colombians place in that. That includes corporates that operate in Colombia. Because part of the integration process is to afford people that are held with suspicion an opportunity to be integrated in society, to be trained, to get back to work, to get back through education, to be schooled, to be integrated. Exclusion and marginalization is a fantastic seed for instability in any society. So the political leadership has created a fantastic framework to give Colombia a chance. A new partnership has to be created where businesses will play a very important role in assisting the uncertainty amongst those who are returning from the, from, from the bush to feel that they are welcome right. and they can be integrated. And I think the rest of society will find it easier to follow on the lead that we as, as private sector in that environment will provide. It's not going to be an easy journey, it's a difficult journey. I can give you a lesson from the South African context, which might be very different from the Colombian setting. Mandela left us a peace dividend. But that has been betrayed to the extent that those that were marginalized during conditions of apartheid, many of them still feel marginalized today. And they begin to question the efficacy of that peace project. Exclusion is a big, big enemy to peace and stability. Absolutely. One of the fundamental drivers of that, for sure. Great point. Another question, or yes, please. And then I'll have time for one more, just be ready. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kumagai, and I'm a chief economist at the Daiba Institute of Research in Japan. And I have one question to President Santos. And, uh, uh, political leaders are always uh, cautious about uh, 
uh, the election results. And uh, I think, uh, in general, uh, if uh, political leaders start a war, uh, his or her uh, approval ratings uh, increase, increases. On the other hand, if you seize the war, uh, your uh, approval ratings might decrease. Uh, how do you cope with or get over that difficult problem? Uh, this is my question. <laughs> you have a perfect example. Uh, I was Minister of Defense, very effective. Um, I, I was talking about this uh, earlier on. Uh, leadership in times of war, of war is relatively easy. Uh, the bad guys are over there, the good guys are around you. You rally the forces. And if you're effective, you show trophies, people clap, and your ratings go up. That's why I was elected president. When you get into a peace process, that type of leadership changes dramatically. It has to change. Uh, leadership in times of peace, uh, first, the mere fact of sitting down with your former enemies brought down my polls 20%, simply by sitting with them. Mm -hmm. But when you start discussing concessions to them, your polls will go even further down. And the leadership you need there is to change the mentality of the people. Uh, you were talking about the book of Desmond Tutu. That's yes. exactly. Learn how to forgive. Learn how to think differently uh, 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 with uh, respect to the people who killed your daughter or your son. Mm. This is very difficult, mm. uh, but it has to be done if you want peace. And, uh, and many times people resist, and this is natural, this is, uh, this is normal. Uh, to forgive is very easy, very difficult. Uh, to hate is very easy, but changing that is, is a, a, a different kind of leadership. And uh, it creates a lot of a lot of contradictions, and that's why the polls go down. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you have to persevere. Though it was interesting in 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 the wider session, President Santos, you did describe though that that what kept your spirits up and and actually, you, you know, the folks who really helped contribute so much to the peace process were the victims, oh, yes. the ones who had suffered the most. That's a that was a, a very Good example. It's a lesson that I learned uh, from this process. Many people ask me, "What, what did you uh, get out of it personally?" I said, "A lot of things, but one of the most uh, dramatic was I was absolutely convinced at the beginning mm -hmm. that the victims, because they are victims, were going to be the the ones that would resist most a peace process, because a peace process." Will has to have an ingredient of forgiveness, yeah. and uh, the victims who were very, very hard for them to forgive the atrocities that these people uh, committed. But as time went through, went went by, uh, and uh, a professor at Harvard, uh, a Professor Hafitz at the, the Kennedy School, he told me at the very beginning. You're you're going to <coughs> you're going to take a path which is extremely difficult, and you're going to be uh, feel very abandoned and very frustrated. Talk to the victims, and that's what I did. And I started uh, talking to the victims and said, "Tell me what happened to you." These are the most dramatic experiences. I mean, you said, "My God, how how could you survive after all that suffering?" And and uh, then when he said, "But please." continue, President, because I don't want other people to suffer as I have suffered. That gave me the whole energy <laughs> yes. to continue. Yeah. So it was a very good experience on, on feeding, in a way, from the, the victims to continue right. and persevere. Right. Wow. Ron, you just, wanted to yes. come in quickly. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, President Santos provides uh, a fantastic example of responsible leadership, which is what WEF this year is, is talking about. And I want to take that and extend it to economic policy, because it's responsible leadership to be able to do the tough economic reforms at the time of strength, where, i.e. when you're not at the end and you're very fragile and therefore you have to take tough decisions. I think that's extremely 
uh, important to highlight as, as one of the um, uh, titles that Davos has. And also uh, to tie that with the private sector, it is very important also for governments uh, to realize that the private sector um, lifts the burden uh, by providing the jobs that we talked about to, to basically pull those out of poverty. It legitimizes the state if uh, the private sector is introduced within that framework that we talked about, uh, where um, uh, the objectives of the state are, are, are sort of transparent as well as the leadership, uh, which is, I would hope, is always a responsible leadership. Right. Well, we're coming to that time. It feels like we just started. I know we could go on, but we all have tight schedules here. Um, so I, I would like, one, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, your energy's been great. Thank you. Um, and, and also, I just I want to thank this terrific group of panelists. I want to say something at the end about President Santos, but this, it's just been good. And I think what you see here is really that multi-stakeholder partnership, government with leadership, private sector, international organizations. I'll humbly represent civil society. Um, but I think it takes us all uh, in these efforts. And, and at this point, as we know, in a world of rising fragility where the World Bank tells us that conflict is the number one driver of extreme poverty today, not a driver, not among the drivers, but the number one driver, we're all called on to step up in ever more powerful ways. And I'd like to, I just wait, President Santos, I give you the last word to say whatever you want, but I may pose a question to just say, what can we do here to help you accelerate the process even more? Well, uh, my friend, uh, to my right, uh, go and invest more in Colombia. <laughs> uh, uh, the IFC, give me more credit. Uh, uh, the, mining, the mining sector can, can go there and, and buy more and invest more in, in gold. And in terms of the... Uh, uh, monetary, international, multilateral institutions uh, give us a bit more room. Um, and uh, <laughs> that, that was great. Uh, <laughs>